So I, I don't know about you all, but I've been a member of the council since 94, and I am just taken aback by the number and quality of events that Neve has been putting on over the past year. And if you haven't noticed, but it's just remarkable, the status of the visitors that we have coming in and the quality of the events. So just a quick way to go, Neve, and give you that. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I don't know if you've been watching the news, but every day there's a different, uh, you know, there's a different treat. Uh, Kim Jong-un, our little cuddly friend there in North Korea, continues to uh, go forth with different um, threats and innuendos about what he's going to do and, you know, matched up with Dennis Rodman diplomacy. We have what can only be determined, can only be put out as a, a very instable and dangerous situation given that they launched, um, they have a, a nuclear capable military, uh, they continue to threaten with real missile launches, and it's just a very tenuous and difficult time on the peninsula. Having served there, I know how um, difficult uh, and quickly things can change. The, um, uh, the question right now is what will happen? What will the role of China be? Uh, how will the South Koreans react? How can we contain the situation? And tonight we're fortunate to have Ambassador Chris Hill with us to discuss these issues. Uh, you have the biography on your uh, chairs, but I just want to tell you, uh, there are a few people in our country who have served in a variety of positions that Chris has. Uh, to put together the term rock star and diplomat, uh, it doesn't happen very often, but Chris uh, can do that. He's been the ambassador to Iraq in 2010. Um, he was previously the special envoy to North Korea and the ambassador to South Korea. Uh, he was the ambassador to Poland uh, during a time when they entered NATO. Uh, he was the player to be named later in the, in the Balkans deal with uh, Ambassador Holbrook, who was uh, uh, Chris's mentor and uh, became the ambassador to Macedonia, the first ambassador to Macedonia, later served as a special envoy to Kosovo. Um, very rarely do you find a diplomat who has such geographic breadth of experience. And we're truly honored and um, lucky to have with us tonight Chris Hill, uh, Ambassador Chris Hill, Dean of the Corbell School at the uh, Denver University, to talk to us and share with us his um, uh, his viewpoints on uh, North Korea. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much, John, for those very kind uh, remarks. And it's nice to see you in your natural habitat here in uh, in Chicago. But we enjoy having John out in uh, out in Denver because we have been uh, working together. I think on some very very exciting. Uh, exciting projects. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out here. I, I know that, um, while I understand that uh, Kim Jong-un uh, threatened the uh, Chicago Council and uh, said that you sh need to disperse as soon as possible. So I know this is a kind of an act of uh, defiance on your part to, uh, to, to come out here. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's so many distinguished uh, uh, people here, Ambassador Kenny, who's, who's here, uh, with whom I think we served uh, at the same time in the European Bureau, and Ambassador Kenny was in, in Ireland, and I was over in the Ireland of Eastern Europe, uh, otherwise known as, uh, as Poland. Um, but uh, it is, uh, I think, a, a, a Great pleasure, a great honor, and frankly, a little intimidating to have Bob Gallucci sitting here in the front row because he knows a lot, an awful lot, about these subjects, having actually done several books on it. By the way, I'm working on my first book, Bob. Uh, I, I just got back comments from Simon and Schuster, and um, I, they like it except for content. No, I, I <laughs> uh, it's. Uh, Actually, it's, it's in pretty good shape, so I have to get some work, get it back to them, sort of a ping pong match, but uh, you know, we'll see when it, uh, when it comes out. But uh, anyway, it is um, great to, uh, to be here and talk about one of my favorite subjects, um, that is North Korea. 
you know, those are people who, you know, only a mother can love. I mean, it is an uh, amazing uh, uh, situation. I guess before that, I should tell one little joke. I think it's kind of customary. And uh, um, having served in Poland uh, and sort of steeped in Polish history, there was this uh, Polish, um, Polish party first secretary in the 1950s and early 60s known for kind of long speeches and not very successful metaphors. And he once stood in front of a large crowd in Krakow and said, uh, comrades, just a few years ago, our country stood on the very edge of a deep abyss. And I'm here to tell you today that we've taken an important step forward. <laughs> so whether, whether, North Korea is doing just that, uh, time will tell. But uh, I must say, the crisis that has gone on in the, uh, in the last few weeks, I think has really been, uh, been a very tough one uh, for everybody, for policymakers, uh, whether you're in Beijing or Washington, it has been about as tough a situation. Uh, but I think one aspect of it that has been very important is that we've all pretty much stayed together. You do not see a lot of daylight between the South Korean government, for example, and the US government or the Japanese government. I think everyone has a, a kind of similar approach. And even China, where things do not necessarily happen in a hurry, where, uh, you know, where they have made, I think, some, some uh, some changes that we will see in the uh, maybe coming months and years, but even China, I think, has sort of come into line with what a number of us uh, or what a number of countries have felt for a long time. When I first uh, started this uh, dealing with North Korea, I was, uh, I was ambassador in South Korea and I was asked to come back to Washington, this is in 05, uh, 2005, and to um, take up the job of Assistant Secretary for, for East Asia, but also to be the head of the U.S. delegation to the Six Party Talks. And I took the job, not that I had any um, great uh, optimism about what could be done about North Korea, but I was extremely concerned about what was being done to our other relationships in the region, especially with South Korea. I think our failure to engage in, in negotiation in 2001, 2002, 2003, that failure to engage in negotiation, the sort of um, uh, very uh, you know, strong statements being made out of Washington, which if you look at a map is a long way from the demilitarized zone between South and North Korea, that kind of bellicose statement coming out of, the statements coming out of Washington were actually really harming the, uh, the fabric of the U.S.-South Korean relationship, such that in, by the late uh, 2004, uh, a majority, well, or upwards of almost 50 percent, so not quite a majority, of South Koreans in responding to opinion surveys were naming the United States as the chief culprit in the North Korean uh, nuclear program. Now, if you, have, if you have a policy that is turning North Koreans into some sort of victims, uh, if you have a policy that is gaining that kind of sympathy for North Korea, my suggestion is try something else because that was frankly killing us. And I think we need to understand, and I think we do understand, that in the long run, the country on the Korean Peninsula that counts, the country on the Korean Peninsula that's going to be with us for a long, long time is, in fact, the Republic of Korea. And if we're not going to be able to get on the same sheet of music as the South Koreans, we're not going to solve this problem. So when I entered the whole uh, negotiation process in the spring of 2000. Uh, uh, five. In fact, I started with uh, on Valentine's Day. I remember it very well. Uh, I, my main concern was not necessarily to try to solve North Korean um, uh, nuclear ambitions. Because, you know, uh, in diplomacy, uh, it, it's, it's, there are a lot of problems out there that are not going to be easily solved. Uh, it's not a matter of coming up with good ideas. It's not a matter necessarily of building the relationships you need in order to get the uh, um, get things moving in, in the right direction, it's often simply a function of the fact that you're not going to be able to find common ground. But you will be given some credit for trying, and I think the United States received a lot of credit for trying as we, as we started out in this six-party uh, 
party process. I took on the position thinking that we really needed to work much more closely with China, and I'll get back to the subject of China, and uh, South Korea especially, but also Japan. And so, um, borrowing some of the pages from my uh, Balkan uh, uh, manual, I uh, thought that what we really ought to try to do is, first of all, say where we're going with the six-party talks. That is, don't just try to solve everything in one swoop, but have at least a one-page statement of where we were heading, what the main obligations of all the parties would be. So we worked, and, and in order to do this, I knew that we couldn't just uh, have one of these desultory international negotiations where you come in on a Tuesday, you talk on a Wednesday, and then you fight the traffic back out to the airport on Thursday. So what I, ins uh, what I really insisted on with, my Ch Chinese, uh, with the Chinese hosts of the six-party process, uh, a gentleman named Wu Dawei, is that we need to stay there until we made uh, progress. Now, Wu was a little worried whether the food supply of China would hold up uh, uh, during that period, but uh, the Chinese agreed that we would stay until we had real progress. We weren't going to just do a chairman's statement and claim that there was some, some statement. We were going to get some agreed statement of all the parties. So um, we had, a uh, first of all, a difficulty of uh, getting the North Koreans to agree to even come back to the, uh, to the talks. They were boycotting them from about 2004, 2005. And this sort of, um, this sort of process that the North Koreans engage in of, uh, of boycotts of the talks, today everyone knows it's their fault. In those days, it was kind of, we were kind of accused of, uh, of being the reason the North Koreans somehow couldn't come back to the, to the talks. So we, we arranged to meet the, Nor the North Koreans uh, uh, bilaterally in, um, in Beijing. This was in uh, June of 2005. The North Koreans, uh, uh, my instructions were to have the Chinese there, but when the time came, there were no Chinese. We called up all the uh, numbers we knew in the foreign ministry, no Chinese. And then the, uh, there were no North Koreans either, and so when we, uh, when we tried calling the North Koreans, they said, we want to make sure there are no Chinese there. So I said, well, as a matter of fact, there are no Chinese there. And I just decided that since the North Koreans were going to announce that their participation in the talks uh, after, the, after those, uh, that meeting, that I should simply go ahead and have the meeting, which I did. Uh, Several senators tried to block my nomination to uh, Baghdad, Iraq, um, because of that some four years later, but uh, I felt it was the right thing to do. I called it calling an audible, and uh, you know, because I knew that if we got through with this meeting with the North Koreans, we could at least get the talks going. So we did, and uh, we worked very hard, and finally in September, after some six weeks of negotiations, we agreed on something called the Joint Statement, and the Joint Statement of September 19th has a provision in it that calls on that the, where the North Koreans agree to, uh, to abandon, we use this term of art, abandon, all of their nuclear programs. We didn't want to get an argument about whether it's a weapons program or a medical isotope uh, program. By the way, the idea of North Korea producing medical isotopes just does not pass the giggle test, but uh, <laughs> it is amazing how other countries have picked up on that little, uh, uh, you know, the wiggle room provided by medical isotopes. Anyway, um, North Korea agreed, uh, agreed to do it. It was quite a fight. But to this day, I think it is appropriate that we hold them to their agreement. They agreed uh, to, uh, to do it in, in, um, to abandon all their nuclear programs in return for economic assistance, in return for cross-recognition of states, in return for a non-aggression uh, uh, agreement on our part that we would not attack uh, North Korea either with nuclear or non-nuclear weapons. Essentially, everything they wanted we put on the table and we said everything is possible with denuclearization, but without denuclearization, nothing is possible. We made very clear that we were not prepared to have a normal relationship with a nuclear North Korea. Some people uh, earlier in the, um, in the process, I mean back uh, a few years before, uh, there was an insistence that North Korea denuclearize, do everything before we would do anything. 
And in fact, one of the things we did in 05 was agree with the North, uh, agree with the Chinese and the South Koreans that we would do sequencing. If they would do something, we would do something, we'd do step for step and uh, get to a point where they would denuclearize and we would fully uh, comply with all of our, our requirements. There was a big issue about whether we should uh, agree to a civil nuclear program, but since uh, it is every nation's sovereign right to have a, a civil nuclear program, provided they're in the context of international agreements on that, we finally, we finally got Washington even to agree to that. So, but as typical with the North Koreans, they want something until they don't want something. So they would ask for things. You'd go back to Washington, and I gotta tell you, the climate in 2005 was not so easy uh, for a foreign service officer to get concessions out of Washington. And you'd kind of move heaven and earth to get them something. Uh, I didn't think getting them uh, an agreement that we would not attack them with nuclear weapons would be that difficult, but believe me, I had a lot of disagreement on that, especially from the then vice president's office, but uh, nonetheless, we were able to uh, get that agreement as well, that we would not attack North Korea with nuclear weapons. And that's also in the uh, September 19th uh, joint statement. And yet, when the North Koreans got all these things, it's, it's as if they didn't want them in the first place. But nonetheless, we had, we, we, we had them agreeing to them in paper. We worked through it. There were uh, other parts of the U.S. government that had been working very hard to find new sanctions against North Korea, which was fine with me. In the Balkans, we used to talk about how we could bomb and talk at the same time. I didn't see why we couldn't negotiate a nuclear deal and not have sanctions going at the same time. So we did all that. Uh, sometimes the big problem, for me, the big problem with some of these sanctions was that they were sort of oversold, like some kind of uh, cure for cancer. And so um, we had, at one point, we went after an obscure bank, and I mean obscure, a uh, uh, place called, it was called by its acronym uh, BDA, which I always thought was Bomb Damage Assessment, but BDA was uh, something called Banco Delta Asia. And lo and behold, there was $23 million worth of North Korean accounts that we pounced on and uh, wouldn't give back to the North Koreans. Well, that caused about a year and a half delay in any negotiating process. We certainly got their attention. Maybe more importantly, we got the attention of the other banks in the world uh, besides Banco Delta Asia who may be considering taking North Korean accounts in the future. So I think we made our point. And then at a certain time, I asked uh, Secretary Rice, well, I think it's time we uh, drop this one and kind of moved on. And then we found out that no one knew how to drop it because it was uh, something rooted in something called the Patriot Act in section, I think, 310 of the Patriot Act. And so there was no means to reverse the sanction. So I said, well, what kind of tool is that when you do something and then you can't undo it? I mean, that, uh, and it became a kind of sanctions doomsday machine that once uh, implemented could never be unimplemented. We got through that. I think we ended up money laundering the uh, funds through the Fed and the Russian Central Bank and ended up with the money in some Russian Far East Bank. But uh, uh, I kid you not. It'll be in the book, too. Uh, so in fact, it'll be in the book with a lot of names and details of that. Uh, but. Uh, so uh, finally, we got to the point where we were able to uh, get Yongbyon shut down. Yongbyon is the uh, plutonium uh, plant. Now, of course, Yongbyon had been shut down before. Uh, Ambassador Gallucci knows a lot about that. But uh, I was in an administration that considered just a shutdown uh, something not good enough. And uh, it's true it was not good enough, but you know, you can't dismantle or disable a plant until you shut it down. I mean, it's like fixing your toaster while it's still on. It's probably not a good idea. So uh, it took a while to convince people, well, let's shut it, let's get it shut down. And we did get it shut down in the summer of uh, 2007. Noticed uh, uh, two years have already almost passed since we got the agreement in September 05. My hair, which used to be a sort of uh, dark brown, had in the meantime turned into what it uh, is today. Uh, and, but nonetheless, you know, we got it done. We got the international inspectors in there. And then we tried to go to the next stage, getting some concessions, uh, getting uh, 
uh, agreeing to give the North Koreans some fuel oil, ag agreeing to make some political concessions, in return for which we wanted to see if we could disable the plant. Now, this became another big issue because disabling a plant is, uh, uh, by definition, can be reversed. In fact, just about anything you do can actually be re uh, reversed. I remember meeting with a bunch of think tankers in Washington and saying, you know, the trouble is you can, all of these steps can eventually be reversed, so you try to make them as difficult to reverse as possible, but in order to make them irreversible, you'd have to shoot all their scientists and, uh, and someone said, well, what's wrong with that? And so uh, none of this could be, so what you're trying to do is sort of move this adversary into a different place, move them step by step, literally, and then see if they can be comfortable with that different place and then realize that they're going to still be there, still be in existence. So uh, finally, it took a while, but we finally got them to agree, and we, it took a lot, a lot of Chinese urging to get the North Koreans to blow up the cooling tower. Now, of course, I had to deal with a lot of arguments that they don't really need a cooling tower. They can just put boiling hot water into the river nearby, which they could do, but not even the North Koreans uh, were pre quite prepared to, uh, to do that. So we essentially put the... Um, put the plant out of, uh, out of service and made sure that it wouldn't be easy to put it back into service. Uh, of course, the, uh, the, the, then the issue became, how are we going to verify what they're doing? Now, uh, the North Koreans gave us something called a, uh, their declaration, which is part of sort of the international uh, process by which you denuclearize. And people who wouldn't trust the North Koreans to offer the time of day suddenly looked at this thing and said, well, you know, we need to make sure that they make this complete. And those of us doing the negotiations were trying to say, look, um, even if it's incomplete and I don't believe a word the North Koreans say, can we at least get on to the stage of verification? So it took us months and months to do that. And uh, by that uh, end, when we got to verification, there's where the final problem uh, lay. That is, the North Koreans were prepared to have us verify that uh, Yongbyon was, a, uh, in fact, shut down, something we could have figured out, and, uh, but were not prepared to allow us to verify sites where we suspected them of having uranium enrichment. And so, ultimately, we were not able to make any progress, and we had to end the negotiations. I think the, um, the Obama administration uh, felt that uh, perhaps the North Koreans were kind of waiting for the new administration to take the next, uh, the next step. In fact, I think we had taken the negotiations as far as we could go. Uh, clearly, um, Kim Jong-il had, uh, by the summer of 2008, which is when the whole thing collapsed, or the fall of 2008, had become Kim Jong very ill. He had a... Uh, he had had a stroke and uh, clearly was not, not going to be in charge. So, uh, so there was another possibility that he would get better, the North Koreans would re-engage with a new administration. But it was very clear by the, uh, by the uh, um, beginning of the Obama administration that we were not going to be able to make much more progress. What was very different, however, by 2009 was that nobody in the region, nobody in the region doubted that the United States was trying all we could do. And so um, at that point, I, don't, uh, I felt, and uh, people have often said, you know, you seem to have gone from being a soft liner to a hard liner. I felt it was very necessary to um, not to uh, uh, continue to engage when there was no real, real, uh, outlook for any, uh, for any, uh, for the verification that we needed. The North Koreans then uh, famously in 2009 did their second test. Uh, later, um, you know, they, uh, they then uh, in 2010 showed off uh, a, a uranium enrichment facility which uh, to some American scientists, which to this day we are not sure really, uh, really uh, is functioning or not. But uh, anybody who says they know exactly what the North Koreans are up to, I can assure you, doesn't know. And that's what makes this current situation so, uh, so difficult. So as we now uh, come around, then the North Koreans engaged in some uh, pretty horrendous provocations, uh, torpedoing a uh, South Korean uh, Navy ship and, and lying about it. Uh, they uh, then uh, 
um, in the, in the uh, end of 2010, uh, shelled a South Korean island. Uh, again, no, uh, no effort to, uh, to deal with the truth there, claiming that they were provoked. And so at that point, the negotiating process, I think, uh, probably quite rightly, went into the deep freeze. In the meantime, Kim, Jong, uh, Kim Jong-il uh, was appearing less and less, and it was quite, quite clear that he was not going to be able to reassume any uh, uh, leadership position. And at that point, and by the uh, following year, he was dead, and we had Kim Jong-un. Now, we don't know a lot about Kim Jong-un. I had been to uh, uh, North Korea several times, tried to meet the leadership, uh, at one point in uh, 2007, uh, uh, President Bush had allowed me to carry a letter from him. It, uh, it was actually to all the other uh, members of the six parties. But when I got to North Korea, I said, uh, I, my instructions, I kind of fibbed a little. I said, my instructions are to uh, hand this only in person to your leader. And they said, well, he's not in Pyongyang. I said, no problem, I'll wait. Uh, they said they don't know when he'll come back to Pyongyang. I said, no problem, I'll go where, where he is. And then finally, after two days of this, I realized I was not even going to deliver the letter, so I had to say, new instructions, I'm allowed to give it to the foreign minister. So I walked up six floors of the foreign ministry and handed it to this little guy who was very, very pleased with himself. In short, they didn't really allow us to see anybody when we were there. I have seen a lot fewer than the fewer uh, uh, senior North Koreans than that former Chicago Bull um, uh, <laughs> power forward, I guess you would call him, although I don't remember him scoring any points. Uh, but uh, they kept, you know, they, they really kept their kind of, uh, you know, they, they, they're very proud of their opaqueness. I mean, they don't want to uh, let us uh, uh, let us think that uh, we, or let us into, you know, what their secrets are, what they really, uh, what they really, uh, what is really going on. I was able to see their, uh, meet the head of their parliament. He clearly didn't seem to know why he was meeting me, but he thought I was Russian, so he gave me a big bear hug. <laughs> um, I uh, was able to get out of town. I was able to uh, drive to, uh, to uh, Yongpyeon, to the um, uh, Yongbyon rather. Yongpyeon is a ski resort in South Korea. Yongbyon is a nuclear facility in North Korea. <laughs> um, we were driving. It's about two and a half hours or so um, out of Pyongyang, unless you get lost. And so what happened was uh, the North Korean minders had us take a left on a dirt track, and then after about 20 minutes of going along this dirt track, past a uh, little village that, like a lot of uh, North Korean villages, incongruously has these six-floor apartment buildings, and you wonder, what's that about? And it was clearly some past diktat that we will bring the cities to the countryside. So in the middle of nowhere, you have a six-story building, uh, which doesn't have any window frames in it or anything, although people are, people are living there. And at that point, our convoy of four or five uh, vehicles stopped, and then the North Koreans got out and screamed at each other for about 10 minutes, at which point we turned around and went back to the main road and went another 10 or 15 minutes on the main road, at which point we turned on the, onto the correct dirt road and uh, found uh, the Yongbyon uh, uh, plant. In short, I saw a little of North Korea, but, you know, you, there's so little that you can... Uh, you can uh, um, gain from just this kind of uh, this kind of uh, tour. I must say, going through a couple of these villages, you know, people would basically never look up from uh, from the ground, where they're clearly, you know, collecting uh, collecting little scraps of wood. Uh, it is a tough existence in in that country. So um, anyway, the North Koreans don't really let you in on what's really going on there, and so I think in many respects we are entering this current crisis. With, uh, with very little knowledge of what is going, of what is actually happening. I do believe that um, Kim, um, uh, Kim Jong-un is, um, is about as not ready for prime time a leader as you will see anywhere in the world. Uh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that he has a clue about what he's really doing. I don't think he's really in charge. I think it's more, uh, He's a kind of cult figure or a third generation cult figure and I think the North Korean military uh, is sort of calling most of the shots. 
Uh, at one point in one of my visits, I asked to meet members of the North Korean military on the assumption that maybe they know uh, something. Uh, and uh, even with the North Korean military, they don't tell you a lot, although they took me through a sort of uh, Disneyland tour of, uh, of the, uh, the Korean War, explaining how the U.S. had, uh, had attacked North Korea, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't really, you know, it's hard to say what they feel, but what we do know is that they all live in this not so splendid isolation. And so I think um, the idea that they're being led by Kim Jong-un is probably not correct. It's probably more these uh, military, uh, military leaders. They're probably members of, uh, of the nomenclatura, that is the people that uh, Kim Jong-il was able to satisfy with various gifts, these sort of what r remains of the sort of party structure of North Korea. Uh, and so I think he is his regent, Chung Sung Tech, is probably a key, uh, a key figure. He's the brother-in-law of, uh, of um, uh, Kim Jong-il. Uh, Chung Sung Tech, I think, was behind those early efforts at firing some of the North Korean military that we saw uh, back in uh, uh, 2000, 2012. But again, we haven't seen much of that since. Uh, I think it's probably clear that Kim Jong-un is not being well received by the North Korean people and they are trying to showcase his leadership and what better way to do that than to stand up to the, to the uh, U.S. So I think there are a lot of reasons to be very uh, concerned that uh, we have a, uh, a leader who's not really a leader. Uh, we have a country that has no concept of how it's being perceived in the world. Um, I think the most important development we've seen in, in recent weeks is, first of all, the U.S., South Korea, Japan, everyone's pretty much stayed together. That is so key. The second thing that I think is very important is clearly the North Koreans, uh, the Chinese have had enough. Uh, they don't say that. That is not their way. But if you hear, uh, uh, if you if you hear uh, President Xi Jinping uh, speak, the, uh, if you heard him speak the other day or read about uh, his his speech, is very clear that they are getting to the end of their rope. However, I don't think the Chinese. I think the complexity of North Korea for China is considerable. I don't think this is a matter of China worrying that North Korea will collapse and send uh, you know 23 million um, North Korean refugees into China with the last one remembering to turn out the lights. I don't think that is a real issue. I think more likely it is much deeper than that. There's a lot of kind of old thought, old thinking in China where if North Korea goes down, that must be a U.S. victory and a Chinese defeat. Uh, I think that kind of thinking has to be overcome. Uh, I think there's also a concern that if North Korea goes down, what kind of questions to, uh, start getting opened up within China about uh, the role of the Communist Party, et cetera, et cetera. So it has a kind of weird, in a weird way, it could have some reverberations and the rather delicate balance within China between those who think that their political structure is wholly inappropriate to their economy and those who think that somehow the political structure is, is the leading edge of the economy. So I think if a Marxist-Leninist regime goes down in North Korea, I think Chinese would fear that that would kind of rekindle a debate, and this time a debate that would come at the expense of the Communist Party. I think those are the kinds of things that worry the Chinese. And to the extent that we have, uh, we can affect this overall situation, I think our task ahead is pretty clear. Stay very close to the Japanese and the South Koreans. Thicken up missile defense for two reasons. One, because we don't know what the North Koreans are going to do. And two, because we know that that is something the Chinese pay attention to. And, uh, and thirdly, I think we need to have a much more in-depth uh, conversation with the Chinese. We have various operation pl operational plans on what to do in the event of a North Korean uh, collapse. We need to kind of share the gist of some of this planning with the, North, with the Chinese so that the Chinese understand what we are trying to do and what we're not trying to do. We are not going to try to station U.S. forces up on the Yalu River. We are not going to put listening posts up on the Yalu River. We are um, looking for, uh, in fact, I think in the, con in the context of a united uh, Korean peninsula, we would have a hard, we'd be hard pressed to convince our Congress even to keep the 30,000 that we already have in uh, South Korea. So I think we need to have that conversation with the Chinese. They would probably would not listen to us the first 49 times, but I think if you keep doing it, whether you're selling soap or selling a policy, I think people will eventually uh, get with it and start buying your product. And so I think we need to uh, 
kind of have a more serious discussion with the Chinese. And in that serious discussion with the Chinese, we have to have a better sense of what's important, what's a top echelon issue, and what's not a top echelon issue. So when you see these senior American officials going off to China with this Christmas tree list of, or Christmas list of everything we want, uh, we need to prioritize that list a little better than we have, and I think North Korea is probably the, the situation that we need to really, uh, really pinpoint. I do believe that out of this uh, kind of mess, which is really this bluster that has truly turned into buffoonery of late, with North Koreans telling embassies in Pyongyang to run for your lives, and the embassies say, no, no, we're fine here. I've never seen that in my life, but uh, uh, I think uh, we need to, uh, take out of this kind of mess a, uh, a renewed uh, effort to try to uh, work closely with the South Koreans because they are going to be facing the lion's share of this. We need to really make sure that out of this mess comes a strengthened U.S. Uh, ROC alliance. And we need to see if out of this mess can be a better understanding with the, with the Chinese. So I think if we, can, uh, if we can pull that off, I do believe that April is a crucial month. Um, because I think the, uh, the um, exercises, the annual exercises, my only regret about our exercises is we didn't have them in the spring of 1950. Uh, I think these annual exercises will be coming to an end. Maybe some of North Korea's bluster will be coming to an end, although that remains to be seen because I don't think uh, the North Koreans how to know how to pull that off. My one sense of uh, optimism on that score was one time I was talking to the North Koreans and I objected to some nasty piece of propaganda that they were issuing and I said, I can't believe you're saying that. And he said, what, you don't want us to say that? I said, no, I want you to say this. And he said, okay, we'll do that tomorrow, it doesn't matter. So, you know, in short, while for us a politician might have a big problem reversing uh, herself on, on, on an issue, uh, I don't think the North Koreans are quite as traumatized by, you know, flip-flopping and that sort of uh, problem that bedevils American politicians. So I think they could get out of this if they really wanted to. So uh, it will depend on whether we can hang together with uh, all our partners and allies. And I think so far, I think the administration has done a very good job on that. So I think I'm in overtime here, so maybe we should go over to a more interactive process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Now we'd like to go out to you for questions. If you could raise your arm high and wait for my colleague with the microphone. We'll get started right over here, the woman right by you, Anna. Hi, um, there was a segment on NPR last week about Obama's choice of Carolyn Kennedy as Japanese ambassador and whether it was wise to appoint donors or people with foreign policy experience. And I was wondering what you thought in light of the situation in China and in North Korea having someone who's untested. I think um, historically our appointees as ambassador in, in Japan, the key question is not necessarily uh, you know, whether they're a donor or not, or, uh, but rather what the relationship is with the president. I think the Japanese have valued very much the notion of an ambassador who really has a direct line into, into the president. So I don't know uh, her relationship uh, with, the, with, Obama, with President Obama, but I assume it's pretty good. And, and, and as a result, I think probably the Japanese are, are happy with that. Uh, I think there are a number of countries where that is sort of the model and I, I think it works. Uh, and then there's some other countries where I think it's important to have, you know, sort of grizzled veterans like myself who, uh, you know, have seen these, uh, you know, uh, shows before and uh, kind of know how to react to them. And so I think in those circumstances, it's very important to have career people uh, doing that. Uh, I think there is a, uh, it is incumbent on any Secretary of State to make sure that we have a highly motivated foreign uh, uh, um, State Department. Uh, I think in general we do, but I think we need to be a little careful. Uh, I am not, for example, a big believer in taking something that the Pentagon uh, has done, which, I, which is the quadrillennial review to look at, you know, what kind of tanks or tread vehicles or wheeled vehicles you're going to have in four years and, uh, uh, you know, and then try to plan with these four-year increments. I get it when you're talking about that kind of uh, situation. I don't quite get it for the State Department. 
And yet this is considered a great victory that the State Department has adopted military style planning. I think we gotta be a little careful with that and maybe uh, do a better job of having our own corporate culture and not borrowing someone else's corporate culture. I think there's tremendous scope for uh, diplomacy in our, uh, for in, in our foreign policy. And by that I mean diplomacy should not just be the means by which you uh, get others to support military action. That's, that's an element of diplomacy, but I think uh, uh, what I like to think is, you know, Americans have always had a reputation of being practically, very practically minded and uh, problem solving. I mean, I did that since the time I entered the Peace Corps. I mean, people would show me some stupid issue and I'd scratch my head for a while and say, well, it's a head scratcher. And then I'd figure it out. And I didn't do it with any kind of ideology. I didn't lecture anyone. I didn't wag my finger at anyone. And I think uh, we have kind of, as a country, slipped into this kind of finger wagging and uh, I think we gotta get back to what we really are, which is a very practical people who disagree on bunches of things, but we, we know how to solve problems. And I think when we do that, I think that will be very helpful to our, to our foreign, uh, foreign service, and I think very, very helpful to our country. Um, yeah, right there, please. My name is Andrew Kim. I'm a Korean American. I thought that might be the case. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, recently uh, I read a Wall Street Journal article reporting that the, uh, some influential Chinese are very dis displeased for the current event taking place in North Korea. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> they advocate downgrading its relationship yeah. with the uh, DPRK. Yeah. My, my question to you is, what does downgrading mean yeah. diplomatically and politically? And will it ease the uh, tensions in the region or would it increase them? I think if the North Koreans truly felt that at the end of the day, China is not with them, I think uh, that would be a very good development for the region. And what I take to mean downgrading is that China has a lot of interests in the world. And China has a lot of things it needs to do in the world. China has things that if it doesn't do those things in the world, China will be in a worse position. And so I think, uh, look, I mean, China is going to have problems, on, you know, maritime problems. Everyone has maritime problems, I mean, except Switzerland maybe, but uh, you know. Uh, there's nothing wrong with maritime problems. So, you know, I know it's ugly with the situation with Japan and even with the, uh, Southeast Asia, but it happens. But I don't think China should put itself in the position of being the chief supporter of this uh, regime that I think, frankly, defies description and uh, is beyond the pale of, uh, of what uh, uh, one should expect to see in a government anywhere in this world in, in the 21st century. I think the, ja the Chinese really need to think about whether that's part of their future or whether that's definitely part of their past. So I would hope that downgrading means they've made a decision to go with their future rather than their past. But you know, when you have American diplomats, again, lecturing the Chinese on what their, and what their interests are, it's not very effective. So I think it's better to see the Chinese come up with it themselves. And maybe our job should be uh, to explain to the Chinese what we're really interested in rather than allow Chinese to interpret our actions as somehow uh, aggressive or hostile, et cetera, et cetera. So I think too often hardliners in the United States use the statements of hardliners in China and vice versa. Um, yeah, the gentleman right there, please. Yeah, she's right beside you. That was very interesting, uh, fascinating uh, talk. Uh, I wouldn't have asked a question until you brought up the concern that uh, uh, the Korean uh, government may, in fact, uh, go down. So with that being the case, and since they're a nuclear country, you know, you start to think of the analogy of uh, thinking, well, look at pa Pakistan. If something happens over there, what's going to happen to the nuclear weapons? Yeah. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, we're looking at wackos having nuclear yeah. capabilities yeah. Yeah. and uh, no leadership. Yeah. to figure out what to I do mean, with it. I mean, the problem with um, the theories of North Korean collapse, I mean, I can believe that North Korea eventually, I'm not sure what I mean by this, goes away. 
Uh, I can believe that someday it'll go away. I suspect it will not be when we think and not be how we think. But what I've always had trouble figuring out is what is the spark that makes this, you know, that it really ignites this process. Um, so I think in understanding that spark would get, give one a sense of, you know, what you have to do about the potential of loose nukes. And so I think it's very important that we have these discussions with interested countries about if we woke up and, you know, tomorrow morning there was no North Korea, who's going to take care of those, uh, the, the danger of loose nukes? Should there be some uh, U.S. involvement in that? Should the South Koreans do that? Is there something we can do together with the Chinese? I think these issues need to be discussed. And uh, I think the problem is we haven't really been able to get those front and center with the Chinese uh, because they don't want to hear it right now. I mean, they really don't. And also, I don't think they trust us to keep it secret, keep it quiet, which I think is really essential. But I think your question about loose nukes is, uh, is really goes to the heart of the matter. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that North Korea, the North Korean regime is the best regime in the world to maintain nuclear weapons. Frankly speaking, I think they're about the worst. And uh, I think the day we can wrest these nuclear weapons away from them is going to be a, a very good day. OK, next question. Yeah, right up here, please, in the second row. She's right on the other side, on your left. So what do you think the North Koreans really want? Yeah. Um, I don't think that we've heard that. Yeah. They just bluster, and it's yeah. they'll do this and this, and they accuse us. And what do they want? Yeah. You know, there are um, that question of what North Korea really wants is a question that often can be posed in any kind of uh, dispute among individuals or whatever. What do you really want? And um, sometimes the answer uh, is that they don't even know themselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, this happens when individuals argue and you finally say, what do you really want? And the person can't really articulate it. And uh, I think there's some truth to that with respect to North Korea. I think they don't really know what they want. So we're forced to kind of give answers. Oh, you must want regime stability or regime preservation. Yeah, I guess we want that. Uh, uh, or you must want international respect. Yeah, I guess we do, but we don't like to admit that. Uh, so. What is it? I mean, I suspect that it's a lot of sort of tactical stuff having to do with just the fact that this guy, uh, Kim Jong-un, was not, uh, you know, they didn't kind of groom him, let me put it that way, uh, 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 to, get, to get him to uh, be accepted by the North Korean people. So I think to some extent what we're seeing is what they want is for a government to be accepted. You know, they're not, certainly not going to put it open to real elections. So. I think these arguments that this is all about domestic politics, probably the, that's the right track. Uh, that said, I think uh, they may have some idea, you know, if there are any doubting Thomases or doubting Kims in this, uh, someone might say, now how are we going to get off this ramp? I mean, how, how is this going to, uh, how are we going to end this? And probably there's this idea, oh, they will give us something. They will give us some consideration. So you get this kind of literally minded people who will think, oh, we'll get heavy fuel oil if we just keep this up and then finally, uh, you know, pull it back. They'll give us heavy fuel oil. So there'll be that kind of thinking going on. But I mean, to understand North Koreans is to understand a very isolated people who don't have a feel for how we might be looking at something. And, you know, it, it's, it's funny because when I've used this line a million times myself, I, and I think the Obama administration uses it about a million times a day, which is North Korea threatens further isolation, you know, if they continue this. You know, I, I don't think they mind that at all. I, 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 and uh, I think that's part of the problem. They sort of like this uh, being kind of... Uh, uh, singularized in the world, maybe even respected, uh, uh, but certainly they don't mind isolation. I remember uh, the Chinese were pushing very hard when I was doing the negotiations to, uh, they weren't asking for us to do diplomatic recognition of North Korea, but, he, but they said, you know, it made a big influence on us, the Chinese, when you opened up an interest section in Beijing. And this was, you know, for us, the Chinese, we realized, okay, we're on the way to having this kind of relationship. And so why don't you offer that to the North Koreans? 
So again, I, you know, I moved heaven and earth in Washington and you know, the usual accusations that I was some kind of North Korean sympathizer, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, I got people to say, okay. And then I, I proposed it to the North Koreans. No, we're not interested in that. You know. <laughs> so it's um, some, you know, people need to know what they want. And I think that's one of the biggest, I think in asking that question, you've posed one of the biggest problems in the whole thing. I don't think the North Koreans know what they want. Yeah, Marty Oberman, right there, please. My limited knowledge of uh, North Korea is based on the impressions I drew from uh, David Halberstam's book, The Coldest Winter. Yeah. And I was not impressed, or he didn't seem to be impressed with the competence of the grandfather who founded the country. And I'm just, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm wondering, do you have an opinion about whether Kim Jong-un has any less ability to stumble through for many years as his father and grandfather did in sort of having this country just go on indefinitely. Yeah, I mean, I think he has, uh, you know, Kim, Kim Il-sung, for example, uh, who I, I agree with Halberstam's uh, um, you know, conclusion about him. I, I don't think he was uh, particularly, uh, particularly smart or, or strategic, but you know, his capacity to get some things done, I mean, I think evil things, but nonetheless, you know, he collectivized agriculture, for example. You know, Koreans are, you know, don't like to be told what to do in those terms, and, and he pulled it off. Um, he managed relationships around the world. I mean, you know, I stayed at the, um, uh, at the presidential guest house there in, in North Korea. And uh, because I was the head of delegation, I was entitled to have my own library, uh, which uh, involves sort of going through all these, you know, I looked at all these books, many of which were in English, and, you know, things like uh, Gift from uh, Ceausescu and, you know, people like that. And, you know, you could see that Kim Il-sung, Gift to Kim Il-sung, and you could see that he had um, these relationships around the world that kind of made him feel like he was a somebody. I just don't see that happening with Kim Jong-un. I don't think he has any of that kind of strategic sense. You know, people say, uh, oh, there's a hilarious video, where an interview with his roommate or, uh, or his friend in, uh, from Switzerland, actually he stayed at the, at the uh, North Korean embassy uh, or North Korean consulate. He was driven to school and picked up in a black Mercedes. But, um, you know, I, I don't think he really picked up a lot uh, from this uh, so-called international education. So I think you're getting someone who is really, really not up to this task. And so can he keep it going? You know, I think, uh, you know, cemeteries are full of diplomats who said, no, he can't keep it going. Uh, but you know, I'll add my voice to that. I, I, I just don't see this going on forever. When it changes, we won't be prepared for it. And uh, we need to have these relationships with South Korea. We need to be able to work very fast and with the kind of intimacy that uh, you know, you'd expect of a team. And that's why any of these things, we have to be very much uh, you know, flying in formation with the Japanese, South Koreans, and I think to a greater extent as well with the Chinese. Uh, yeah, right there in the blue tie, please. Hi, it's great to hear your talk. My name is Brian Crew, and for one, I'd like to mention we are alumni of, your, of the school. And personally, I'd like to thank you for your work in Bosnia because it brought my wife home, who was in the Army in Bosnia in those early years. But my question is this. We never lost a soldier <laughs> in Bosnia, and uh, I'm very proud to have been affiliated with that, with that effort. But then I thought, ah, we saw that, we can solve anything, and that was my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> So, so my question is, is, as you mentioned the Chinese, I mean, prior to all the news on North Korea, a lot of the news was actually on natural resources, you know, Japan, you know, some Korea, the Philippines, defense treaty that the U.S. has, you know, squaring off in that area over natural resources. Now we come into the North Korean talks that are going on. As a diplomat, I'm curious, do you find, is it challenging if you're going from, you know, the U.S. is kind of squaring off, or not squaring off, but aligning along with our allies, the Japanese and natural resources, but now we're needing to go into yeah. talks, we're wanting to go into talks with the Chinese to help the North Korea. Well, I think there's no question that China is a major challenge to the U.S. Uh, China does not, uh, uh, you know, they don't quite have the give and take on some of these natural resource issues. I think, uh, um, 
you know, there's blame to go around on these uh, island issues, but I think the Chinese certainly have their share of it. Uh, but all that said, I think we need to be careful with those who would argue that somehow uh, uh, conflict with China is inevitable. I think that is a terrible way to look at it. And to see people so inspired by Thucydides and the Peloponnesian Wars, first of all, people who probably couldn't spell Thucydides, and now we're supposed to look at uh, two, you know, uh, history uh, almost 3,000 or 2,500 years old about uh, uh, that somehow Sparta is the rising power a la China and Athens is the established power a la the US. I mean, I don't think there's enough time in the world to explain the difference between ancient Sparta and modern China. Uh, and I would actually argue that there's not a lot of similarity between US and, and Athens. Uh, so <laughs> I just think we ought to kind of avoid those kinds of, uh, uh, of that kind of approach and just understand that the Chinese are probably going to disagree with us on a lot of things and we're going to have to have a lot of hard-headed arguments. But I tell you, you know, go to Beijing, get a cab and go 45 minutes north of Beijing and see the Great Wall of China and ask yourself, do you really want to get into a fight with the people who make a thing like this? And uh, uh, you don't, you don't. And uh, I, I just feel that, you know, anyone who's kind of spent a lot of time with the Chinese and, and uh, tried to work with them on things, I, I think we can pull it off with China. I really do. I mean, you, you don't, you know, if you're around China, you don't get this impression that there's this sort of anti-Americanism there. I mean, certainly the government has an interest in some anti-Americanism. and uh, But, you know, I, I mean, we have students at the university who go there. They come back with pretty good stories of other Chinese students. I, I, I don't think the U.S. and China should be looking at inevitable conflict. I mean, we've got inevitable competition in areas. But I don't think the Chinese are looking to take over the world, uh, you know. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I mean, it's funny to hear people in other countries think the U.S. wants to dominate the world. I mean, I'm from Little Compton, Rhode Island. No one ever woke up in Little Compton, Rhode Island and said, I want to dominate the world. I mean, uh, and so I, I, I really think, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff about us is, is overblown and a lot of the stuff about China is overblown. Um, yeah, how about right up here, please, in the front. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question is to the missing um, neighbor in the north. You haven't mentioned the Russian interest, if yeah. any, at this point, yeah. which is strategically important. And uh, fi I would agree with you in, with your description with the uh, US and Chinese relationship and yeah. attitudes. Uh, but uh, do you think that China is ready for possible re reunification of Korea? Are they ready for yeah, that? Is China ready for that? Right. I mean, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's kind of two questions. I remember when I, when I lived in Poland uh, in the early 1980s, the wish was that there would be a common Chinese-Polish border. Um, and um, <laughs> you're a little slow, but you got it. All right. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, and I think that question of whether Russia is still, I think, a very actual question. I mean, uh, it is really, is Russia a country that's going to focus westward, or is it a country that's going to slip into some other mode and uh, somehow be more isolated, and then, you know, this uh, Russia Far East becoming a sort of economic outlet for this more isolated, or is it going to be globalized? Uh, so there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about Russia. Uh, I, I worry that the, the Russians, I mean, they certainly, you know, there is no responsible Russian I've ever talked to who supports the idea of North Korea having a bomb. There's absolutely no one who supports North Korea having a bomb, and I don't think any Russian really, frankly, at this point supports North Korea. But I think they are so traumatized by the competition with the U.S. over the decades and uh, traumatized, frankly, to some extent by our triumphalism after uh, the end of the Cold War, which I think if you're a Russian who uh, knows what was going on in Russia, you don't just see that as some external stimulus. You understand that what ended the Cold War was in many respects an internal process in Russia. So I think there are so many Russians who are traumatized by this. It is just too difficult for them to 
try to get on the same page with us and try to see if we can deal with North Korea. And so even though they agree with everything uh, that we and the South Koreans say, they were uh, frankly at times very disappointing in the six party process. And I, I wish that would change, but I'm not sure it would. They have very talented diplomats. They know the situation in North Korea. They, sh they could be a lot more helpful, but they could not quite get themselves to do more. And as for this question of unified Korea, uh, I have talked to many substantial Chinese and they all say to me at least that uh, the issue is not whether it's unified, it will be unified. They know that this is an aberration of history and the Chinese do, I mean, have a long-term view of, of what history means. Uh, but for them, the question is how. And I think t to have this demise of North Korea, as I said earlier, I think is very traumatizing to the Chinese. And it doesn't have to do with North Korean refugees. It has to do with the whole, that would force in China the domestic debate about the relationships of governmental structures and economy, et cetera, et cetera. It would force in a way that the Chinese are not prepared to have that kind of internal debate or open debate. And so I think for them, North Korea uh, in a, it has a kind of weird echo into uh, domestic uh, Chinese affairs. And uh, there's nothing that scares the Chinese more than domestic affairs. You know, I think the Chinese are not so nervous about the world. I think they're nervous about their own internal processes. Um, yeah, right up here, please. Jerry Goldstone. I'm curious to whether you think there are any lessons from your nuclear negotiations with North Korea that could be applied to our discussions with the Iranians on their nuclear yeah. program. Yeah, I, um, my own view is uh, Iran is going to be a very tough nut to crack. I mean, I think it's going to be very difficult. But I think to the extent that economic leverage can be effective, I think it would be relatively more effective with the Iranians than it has been with the North Koreans. I mean, uh, so I, I, in a weird sort of way, I sort of think maybe there's something that could be done uh, with Iran, provided we have a robust uh, political and diplomatic effort. Uh, to be frank, when I see these, um, three-day, uh, you know, um, negotiations with the Iranis, or Iranians, the sort of three-and-out negotiations, I, I don't think that's robust enough on just the technology of diplomacy. Uh, the second thing that bothers me a lot with respect to our, our handling of Iran is the fact that I don't think uh, we have a bilateral channel. And, you know, I, we did make some progress with the North Koreans, and uh, I think we did it because we had everyone together on a six-party platform, but that was a very sturdy platform that we used for other configurations, including bilateral. And my sense from the so-called um, uh, PERM 5 plus 1 uh, negotiations with Iran, uh, which by the way also comes to six, but I guess they didn't want to call it six-party talks. Um, my sense is that they don't have this kind of uh, robust bilateral channel uh, going. And I think too, um, it is about the whole relationship with Iran. We spotted that with the North Koreans, or we think, we think we're right that it's about the overall relationship. But I don't get the sense that we're prepared to deal with that overall relationship. You certainly can't do it in a room of six. So uh, I, I just feel that we could, uh, if we had a, uh, you know, if we agreed, we'd talk to the Iranians, we would have uh, unlimited discussions with them. Uh, I think that would be one lesson from, I think we made progress with the North Koreans when we just kind of forced them to stay and uh, work on it for a couple of months rather than two days. So hard, hard to say, and I'm certainly not critical of anyone who's doing it because First of all, you know, you got a vector in a lot of other stuff, and you know, every time someone from the from from the administration would talk to an Iranian, you know, not everyone in America any longer agrees with the idea that politics stops at the water's edge, 
in some ways it just starts at the water's edge. So I think uh, it's kind of hard to do. And if you're in administration, you've got a million other problems you may not want. And this one is a little, you know, your percentage probability of, uh, you know, of uh, succeeding is probably fairly low. And so you're thinking, we're, I'm, I'm not going to take all this grief for something that I don't think is really going to work. I'm going to work on something else, you know, a sure bet like gun control or something. <laughs> yeah. so. Do we have any questions from our student group here from University of Chicago? Oh, no. they're too smart. <laughs> of course, they know the I, answers. I, I, I. <laughs> All right, so last question then. Um, <laughs> no, hand right I'll there. take one. The no. woman right there in the red, please. Thanks. So what would a new nuclear disablement and verification process look like in North Korea, in your opinion, and how likely is that to happen? Um, I, you know, if they could get back to, uh, to implementing North Korea's commitment to uh, doing away with its, or abandoning its nuclear programs, if North Korea were to reaffirm that commitment, uh, I think we should work quickly, taking advantage of the momentum. Now, I know there are only, you know, NBA analysts and uh, diplomats who believe in momentum, but I really do believe there's something there to it. I mean, so I would start moving very quickly to see if we could get a sequencing agreement and time scale, time frame to get some of this done. Um, you know, there are those who argue that we shouldn't have uh, walked away from the uh, six-party process because we didn't have verification. That is, the, in a practical world, verification works by getting on the ground, starting verifications. They say, by the way, could I have a look at what's going on there? And you try to uh, uh, broaden out the verification once you're on the ground. And that was, uh, I understand that argument, and there's a lot of merit to it, but, you know, in a political context, I was already, uh, you know, taking a, taking a lot of incoming, uh, and I don't mean from Pyongyang, I mean, uh, so um, I'd like to see a sort of tighter sequencing plan and uh, with some real time frames and kind of move, try to move it quickly while the moving is good. That's how I would do it. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Ambassador Hill for his Thank comments. You very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.